it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to start with really saying that Bangor has a special place in my heart. Um, I can count myself as a part of the uh, School of Soil Science that was established by uh, Peter Nye, who was one of the still very few Soil Science Fellows of the Royal Society. So um, he had his PhD student Guy Kirk, and then postdoc Davy uh, uh, Peter Dara. Now Peter Dara had two PhD students. One is Davy Jones, and then shortly after that, I was his PhD student as well. And um, there, it's undoubtedly clear to me that I I am very grateful for the support of Davy Jones here and Guy Kirk for helping me start off my research career in the UK when I came back from America. They really, we formed a partnership and, 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 and supported me when I was starting off, so I'm really grateful for that. And I will describe some of the work we've been doing together. Um, being in engineering department and being a modeler, um, we kind of occasionally find it useful to step back and see why is it that we're doing this modeling uh, of plant-soil interaction. And this is my kind of list. Um, first of all, rich countries are over-fertilizing soils. Um, uh, that leads to pollution. So again, we want to minimize that. Poor countries, on the other hand, cannot afford to afford the same fertilizers. And now there are differing, you know, predictions um, uh, that also say that the phosphate mineral resources are about to run out in the world. So ultimately, we need to find alternative strategies to heavy, heavy fertilization while still, uh, you know, growing the food for the humankind. Um, so we do need to optimize the plant traits and soil amendments. Um, it's just interesting thing <coughs> that I like to bring out is also the World Economic Forum every year um, for consults all the heads of state and big business leaders and comes up with these global risk reports. And in 2014, you can now see there were in top 10, there were four of the uh, top risks uh, facing humankind have a plant and soil interaction at the core if we were to solve those problems. Now in 2015, which is the latest report, that kind of changed a bit. So this is not very easy to say here. It's all the risks, top risks in the world in 2015 by impact and likelihood. So we're interested really in the top quadrant that the likelihood, very likely effects um, that uh, influence human security um, uh, by uh, against the high impact. And again, still, in addition to all these you know, wars and disasters, sort of man-made disasters, we have climate change and water crisis are still in that top quadrant that, that, that needs our attention. Um, and so my approach has been to develop models um, of uh, mathematical models to, that will enable the, these strategies to be studied in silico. It's like, it's unimaginable that we would design an aeroplane without doing aerodynamic calculations in the computer. Um, we should be doing this same thing of si uh, si computer simulations for the plant-soil interaction, crop growth um, uh, modeling as well, uh, to, to be able to find the optimal strategies um, in silico. But what is the problem? The problem is that we don't have the good models. And the reason for this is that soil is really highly complex and multi-scale process uh, system to model. Um, we have a systems on a, is this working? Um, we have things that happen on a soil pore scale. And here you see the soil particles where we imaged with the X-ray CT linked by a mycorrhizal hyphae that are false colored in red here. So we have a really, you know, micron scale effects in the soil. Um, the next layer up is a bigger scale where we have a single root scale processes happening. We have a 
root single root here. We have these slushy regions, which are basically water fills with little clay kind of um, particles uh, in them. Uh, we have root hairs, erenchyma inside the roots. How does all that influence the processes? Then we have single root scale processes where roots can exude organic <coughs> acids out into the soil, change the soil chemistry in the rhizosphere. Uh, but ultimately, we want to answer the questions on a crop scale, on a root system scale. And so the key really is how do you translate this scientific Im information across? Um, and the approach that I like to take um, and, uh, and develop further is that we do this multi-scale imaging and modeling hand in hand with experiments at all, uh, all scales. So traditional mathematical modeling of multi-scale system has just done the modeling on its own and then calibrated the model at one of the scales. Now, that leaves lots of free parameters in the system. And so to tie that together, m my, I, I guess the approach is to, to at every stage, at every spatial scale that we do the modeling, we also calibrate the model hand in hand against the different experiments. And so now micro X-ray, CT, XRS, and SEM, EDX elemental mapping is something we do in-house in Southampton. Um, and then calibrate the models and <coughs> model against this data. Then we move up to the soil column scale experiments. Um, in single plant scale, we go going into very much for neutron radiography uh, and tomography. Uh, and also then the sort of more traditional soil science um, e experiments. Uh, ultimately ending up in a field crop and field scale experiment, which are done in Bangor for us, because in Southampton we don't have fields. Well, <laughs> we have a new forest, but it's protected. <coughs> so I will describe you one approach that we've been doing, and it, that's to do with root hairs. So root hairs are thought to be really, really important for uptake of, stro of strongly bound nutrients <coughs> like phosphate from the soil. Um, and they are thought to be dominating the phosphate uptake because they can penetrate little micropores in the soil. Um, but plant geneticists can breed bold roots or very hairy roots with longer hairs, with less hairs. We can even over, uh, they can overexpress the transporters on the hairs. Now, what is it that we want? Which one is the best for, the, um, uh, for, for growing the crop? So we need to develop the models for how root hairs function <coughs> in the soils. And we started that model building off in, um, in roughly 2003-2004 with by using all the published data to, develop, uh, to develop those models uh, from the literature. And that those first models basically assume that the root hairs on the root on a <coughs> are, are these sort of in a perfectly regimented uh, parallel arrangement along the route. Um, and what we found is from this highly, highly, highly idealized geometry um, that the, the, how the route has functioned for phosphate uptake, that could be described by three different models. <coughs> the first model is where the, the, what, what I call dynamic root hairs, that, that is that the root hairs and the diffusion of phosphate in the soil happen at the same time time scale uh, to each other. And so the model describing it is basically diffusion model with a sink term in it. The second model was negligible hairs. That means that the root hairs are sitting in a soil pore space, just taking up whatever comes to them, but they don't contribute to creation of the diffusion profile very strongly. And the third one, third model was the dominant hairs, that they are like little hoovers going into the soil pores, that as soon as they get into pore space, they suck everything up and leave nothing behind and, um, uh, 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 and, and then stop. Now, if you looked at all the published data of that, uh, um, uh, then the most dominant model suggested based on a gel uh, and genetic studies was this dominant hairs uh, story that they are like little suckers in, in the soil. Um, 
But we then when went like, well, is that really true? Um, because why, why bother basically if they dominate uh, everything at all? Why bother? Why is there a difference if you breed the different densities of root hairs or, or different length? So we started questioning this, that whether the hair morphology that we picked from studies that were done in gels is actually correct. <coughs> um, uh, because it's quite easy to imagine that if you're growing a root hair inside the soil, the soil particles will provide impedance and will modify the morphology of these hairs by just virtue of particles being there. So we took to, could we image the root hairs in the soil? Being in engineering department, you know, you pose that question, we kind of try and answer that and figure out the technique that will do it. And so we, we started looking that we could use the X-ray <coughs> CT to image uh, root hairs. Now the problem with root hairs is that they are 10 microns across. So we need the, to detect something that is 10 microns across, we need a resolution of one micron. So we can't use tabletop X-ray CT scanner because those will take, uh, scan times will be very, very long. They'd be like 12 hour scans at that resolution. So we needed to go to synchrotron X-ray CT um, beam lines. And well, we developed this assay um, to use, uh, to grow the roots in, 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 in these little soil columns and to image the hairs with respect to soil particle surfaces. And this is what we came up with. These, what we really did detect was that the roots in soil were very much more hairy uh, than, than expected or previously found. Um, um, this won a prize and draws at the summer science exhibition is one of the prettiest pictures in, the, in 2013 or something. But the pretty pictures aside, um, what X-ray CT does, it gives you a pretty picture, but it doesn't say anything about its function. So to <coughs> find out what, what it means scientifically, we then took those images and we run the um, phosphate diffusion um, computer simulation in, on it by assuming that in a pore space the phosphate can now diffuse. On a, um, on a soil particle surface, <coughs> we have these first order binding reactions um, and on the root surfaces in green here, the, the phosphate can be taken up from the poor, poor soil solution um, according to this Michael is meant an uptake law. And that now enables us to plot them using, uh, as a result of computer simulations, the, the phosphate profiles. This is now the bound amount of phos phosphate as a sort of on the soil particle surfaces. Um, and, and you can see that there's less near the root than further away there's more. We can plot the diffusion streamlines. Um, uh, so the light blue ones link the soil surfaces to the soil uh, root surface and the purple <coughs> lines connect soil particle surface to the root hair surface. Um, now, crucially, what it allowed us now to estimate is that based on that particular image, the uptake of phosphate by root hairs compared to the root um, was always roughly of the same order. So root hairs do not dominate the phosphate uptake. They are complementary to the root. And that trend that they were roughly the same order uh, of magnitude uh, carried through, through all the different phosphate soil indexes. Um, now, from the modeling point of view, again, model gives you extra, allows you to quantify that, uh, the, the effects of where the phosphate <coughs> is coming to, to the soil surfaces. So it's naturally quite intuitive to think that little 10 micron long filaments, they go into soil pores and they would take up more locally. Mathematical models allows you to quantify how much more locally are they taking up that phosphate. And what we found is that the root hairs take up roughly from the area of half of what th where the root is taking up in terms of the locality of the phosphate. So, so it forces you to quantify the modeling, uh, the different effects. Now we can go back with that knowledge to our original models um, 
uh, having decided that, that the image-based model tells us that it is the dynamic root hairs model from the homogenization procedure um, that is the correct one to use. And we can now start asking questions that, well, do we want longer hairs or denser hairs? And here are the results for uh, basically all these simulations are done um, for the same total root <coughs> hair surface area. But what we are modifying is the increasing the hair length and decreasing the hair density. And we're comparing the single porous soil um, like this, where all the reactions are on a soil particle surfaces, to a dual porous soil where the phosphate can kind of be uh, diffusing out from these clustered uh, um, uh, structures. And what we find is that if you, in a dual porous case, then you want longer hairs. Um, whereas if you, in the single porous case, where the root hair, uh, roots, uh, then phosphate is only bound to the outside surfaces, then you want denser hairs, uh, breed denser hairs with, with shorter length. So one could imagine that there is a sweet spot that you might want to breed for that will perform equally well in both soils. Um, now the next step, having explained out how to deal with a root the hairs, that is a sort of single cell, single root scale ph phenomena, is to move to the root system scale. Now traditional root, syst root system scale models are due to that, mm, our, I mean our, our grandfather Peter and I, um, who was one of the first people with Tinker and Barbara to develop the root plant root nutrient uptake models, which take into account on a single root scale uh, diffusion and convection of um, nutrients in a, um, in a soil pore space, but also take into account the equilibrium binding reactions via this buffer power. Um, at the time when they developed it, um, the big problem for them to solve that was this Michaelis Menten uptake law on the root surfaces um, because it's a nonlinear system and mathematically any nonlinear system would need to be solved numerically basically. But in 1970s, 80s, even 90s when I did my PhD student, it wasn't really conceivable to do the simulation on a root system scale. Uh, uh, cases. So all these first models on a root scale basically relied on having to um, solve a single root scale models. Now in a current day it's really easy, almost the simplest thing you could do is to take this model and do a direct simulation on any given root architecture. So we can scan in the rice root system here, import it into a fine, any finite element package, put it on, a, um, uh, on the um, supercomputer, and within two hours we'll get back a direct simulation of the phosphate profiles for that particular um, uh, root architecture. Now, it sounds simple, but the in a field scale, if we want to uh, answer questions on a field scale or even regional scale or planetary scale, we can't be doing these simulations on, even if it takes two hours on a single root system scale, it becomes still computationally untractable and it's not the most sensible thing to do. So the next thing to do is to, what, what I did was mm. to take the mathematical technologies that we have from the effectively rocket science um, um, uh, there was a Rosine expansion technique developed for dealing with the fluid flows around cylindrical bodies and apply that to the original Knight and Kefaba model. Um, the technical background to that is basically that one has to find an analytic solution uh, far away from the cylinder, then you find a different solution analytically near the cylinder, taking into account all the non-linearities near the cylinder, and then matching the two solutions together. Um, um, that gives rise to algebraic solutions to the single root scale models. And they, whilst they look a bit kind of tedious, they are sing simple equations to type into a numerical codes now. And we can even compare it to a um, here the blue line 
is the numerical simulation from a supercomputer that takes two hours to compute. The red line here for phosphate uptake is a fully algebraic equation, which is basically instantaneous. So now it's really important that we have that almost instantaneous fast um, uh, result um, for uptake of phosphate via a single route because this allows us now to develop the codes which we can optimize. In order to find optimal strategies or do sensitivity studies, we need the codes that run quickly because we can't, we need to rerun and rerun the solutions many, many times. We can't be running hundreds of two hour simulations, even, even though it's tempting. So um, this allowed us now to look at these systems where say, okay, we have a, this root system which is linear branching. So we have a, a bottle brush system where we have a main root and the branches come off it at equal distances. And we run that um, to predict the phosphate uptake by that system uh, when at the phosphate index one and the phosphate index three. And we see there's a big gap. So if we were, if the soil was much poorer in phosphate, there would be a big difference. Then we said, okay, we keep the root system the same size, but we uh, change the root system so that there are more, that the branches near the top are nearer to each other than in the bottom. Um, the, uh, keeping the final overall size of the root system still the same. Could we fix, match the uh, rate of phosphate uptake um, in a, a phosphate index two uh, one soil or not, and we could indeed. So by just simply changing the root architecture, not the overall root volume, no, nothing more, one could already remedy the difference in this phosphate uptake between index one and index three. This was done with <coughs> collaboration with Davy, uh, who did experiments here. Um, similarly, we can now apply these, um, these two kind of try out different soil management strategies to kind of, to mixing the top 10 centimeters of the soil, mixing 20 centimeters plowing, that is inverting the soil, uh, or banded drilling it into different depths. What's the difference in outcomes? Um, the analytic um, uh, approach combined with computational gives us this ability to simulate, and what we find is the difference is that the the different strategies are important at different times. Um, so where are we go growing uh, more recently? Well, we, we started to now really build these image-based models um, uh, where we can observe in 4D the root system development. And that is wh why we can do it is because in the engineering department where I'm based, we have a big volume imaging <coughs> center that houses six complementary um, computer systems, uh, six complementary X-ray CT systems. So we can image things that are really, really small from a nano CT uh, up to the things that are really, really big. So we can have a soil column that is 30 centimeters in diameter, two meters high. Um, the <coughs> it has to be roughly 100 kilograms, no heavier. Um, and combined with a parallel synchrotron system, we can basically image fossils, bones, um, blood capillaries, and lungs. And combining that with supercomputer facility enables us now to do these models um, of plant-soil interaction in much more detail than ever before. Um, this is just to show how the X-ray CT really work, works in case you haven't got. So this is a bone. What X-ray CT does, it projects the X-ray and detects what the picture is. Um, just like when you would go to hospital to check whether you have a broken bone. Um, CT, our system rotates the sample across and takes lots and lots and lots of these pictures. Um, and having got like thousand pixel uh, pictures, we can then reconstruct. It'll get there. 
um, it, it, we, we can use these different thousands of different angles that, that we got the adsorption pic pictures um, to reconstruct what's inside the pot. And we can do that in for one time step, but also we can do it for plants um, at different times. Um, so to get basically 4D picture of, of the um, what happens in the soil. And so this is one of the latest one where we did do the 4D, uh, where you can see the very first time. So this is a maize root growing in the soil. And you can see these light gray bits are water. This is root and the black is air. And we can see that as this root here is coming to this soil pore, you can see a Haynes jump where water pocket basically gets emptied up by the root system. So there's incredible detail we can now detect. And there's particle movements and things happening. Um, so we can extract also from these pictures. The, this is the same movie, but analyzed now differently for where we can find out the how soil particles move in 3D as the root is growing. And what you see here, let's play this again, um, is that they kind of, it does this nutation movement and the par particles are moving mm, in a sort <coughs> of spiralish manner. Um, uh, but crucially, the deformation is only really stops uh, before the root hair zone almost starts. So it's very localized mechanical movement in a soil. And clearly, uh, we're now moving on to studying this. How does the root growth get influenced by compaction of soil, for example, if the soil is more porous or less porous? Um, so the other thing <coughs> we've been doing in terms of soil or soil areas is to do mechanics of testing. So, so we have, um, you know, for example, the railway ballast. How does that deform? Again, this is a 4D simulation, uh, so 4D imaging of, of the railway ballast compaction. <coughs> um, and a couple of kind of uh, media studies, we, we, we imaged that ginormous pliosaur, which is two meters long and, uh, and bits, um, uh, that was found in Weymouth. But we also imaged lots of ar archaeological things with uh, x-ray CT. Um, so um, you, you can find this Roman coin found, which you don't want to kind of start taking it apart. Um, uh, we can CT scan it. We can even detect from the images uh, with high degree of accuracy which emperor it was that, that, uh, that has its picture on those coins. Um, again, all without having. And then the visual archaeology uh, guys in the archaeology department did these sort of fr fancy animations of these coins actually falling into those pots and things. Um, but they are all real coins that are actually inside the uh, burial urn. Um, so what's the conclusions? The, um, so we are now just starting a big project where we are combining the two uh, sort of two different areas of imaging. So we combine structural imaging that gets done with X-ray CT uh, with chemical mapping <coughs> that is done with X-ray fluorescence or SEM EDX elemental mapping for again for phosphate. <coughs> but all that imaging is really done in order to build sorry build a more accurate mathematical model of phosphate uptake or nutrient uptake. Um, and just to outline the steps in that process that it all involve high degree of computation is that first, after having done this uh, structural or chemical um, imaging, we need to reconstruct these models. We need to um, combine them uh, and correlate them. Um, so there are techniques that we use like compressed sensing to minimize the, for example, X-ray dosage of the plants and also phase retrieval to detect the different phases of mucilage versus the roots in soil. Um, then the next step is to analyze these images. Um, there's manual segmentation always involved in nowadays. 
Um, there are some semi-automatic tools, but there are virtually no automatic tools at all for analyzing plant-soil interaction images. And for the mechanical um, studies of plant-soil interactions, we need to be develop we're developing digital volume correlation methods to say how the strains uh, evolve. And then ultimately, we combine all that information into a mathematical model, which we then will solve on the uh, on, on the supercomputer, but then we apply a mathematical homogenization methods, these analytic tools to develop the models that also run on desktops, so wh where we can run these different uh, optimization studies using genetic algorithms um, to find the optimal strategies for soil management or plant breeding purposes. So why does one need to do this whole really laborious <coughs> bit of image-based modeling. Why can't we just do a sort of model that works on one scale? Well, the key is that model that one works on one scale is really useful because it runs quickly, it allows you to interpret data. But the, these alpha models, in a way, that, that are really image-based models and, and, and require more work can be used to validate the, uh, the upscale faster models um, against the scientific hypothesis, because these highly complex models have the most amount of science in them, and we can test which bits of it uh, are, uh, are valid in the big models, uh, big models, and when do the big models fail to capture important scientific uh, phenomena? It also they also act as confidence building in the model, uh, in in the bigger models and uh, allow more detailed scientific um, hypotheses to be tested I I reliably. So I'm going to finish here now, and I'm perfectly in time. I noticed I was given 40 minutes, and I'm precisely 40 minutes. Um, I need to, um, in addition to Davy <coughs> and Guy, I need to also thank my postdocs and PhD students who have done lots of work. Um, and these are the current ones. There is also a whole um, posse of ex-PhD students and postdocs who are now having their own little groups. In Andrea Schnepp has, um, ha is a professor in Germany. So is Daniel Leitner, Costa Sigalakis is now faculty in Southampton, soon to move to Edinburgh. And Zevu Paivandi is in Syngenta. And last but not least, this also, um, I've been very lucky to be funded by many funding agencies, um, which has been invaluable. So, questions? <coughs>